Good, excellent, thank you. Before I begin, I want to thank the European Commission and the Agricultural Committee in particular for allowing me to uh, speak here today. I also want to thank all the NGOs and individuals responsible for my being here, uh, all of which, of course, are too numerous to name. And finally, I want to thank each of you for uh, being here today. Thank you all very much. It is indeed an honor uh, to speak to you. As I have been invited because of my expertise in animal modeling, I wanted to briefly summarize my qualifications. I have uh, more than 20 publications critiquing the animal model per se in peer-reviewed scientific journals. These are not articles reporting the results of animal-based research, but rather they are articles examining the philosophy of science that undergirds the use of animals in science. I am an expert on animal modeling per se, not an expert on really using one animal for one disease or two animals for one disease or whatever. I'm the author of a number of books, book chapters, articles that have appeared both in the scientific li literature and the media, and I've lectured uh, around the world regarding the pros and cons of using animals in science. And there are some pros. I have been a professor at two medical schools in the U.S., and I have no financial outcome uh, in, the, in the conclusion of this debate. I will not be affected monetarily one way or the other. The reason I include the fact that I have no financial interest in the outcome is because many people quote surveys that have been conducted that report to show that almost all scientists support the use of animals in research and testing. These surveys are misleading as, one, almost all of the respondents do have a financial interest in animal modeling, and two, none of the surveys that I have seen address the question that I am an expert in, namely the predictive value of animal modeling as a modality. In reality, there is a general agreement in the biomedical sciences and in the pharmaceutical community that animal models have no predictive value whatsoever for human response to drugs and disease. I cover this extensively in my articles and books. For example, approximately 100 vaccines against HIV AIDS have tested well in animals, including non-human primates. Unfortunately, zero of these have been successful in humans. That is zero out of 100. You do not need fancy statistics to tell you there is no predictive value in the animal model. Likewise, we have seen over 1,000 drugs that offered neuroprotection to stroke patients, and again, zero have come to the market for humans. Despite an overall consensus in the pharmaceutical and biomedical sciences that animals lack predictive value for human response to drugs and disease, most animal experimenters still tout animal models as having predictive value. This, as I said, is my area of expertise. Predictive value is the primary justification for using animals to study diseases and drugs. It is also the basis for all other rationalizations and justifications, and it is demonstrably false. Animals can be used in science in approximately nine different ways. The two areas that concern us are numbers one and two, the use of animals as predictive models for disease and for drug testing. Now surprisingly, numbers three through nine are actually viable uses of animals. You can use animals to replace a heart valve in a human, or as a source of insulin, or just to learn new facts about the material universe. Of course, numbers three through nine also have myriad alternatives available to us today. This was not always the case, but it is certainly the case today. The big problem lies with numbers one and two, and numbers one and two are how animal-based research and testing are sold to society. There are two principles of science that invalidate the notion that animals will be predictive models for humans. The first is evolution. This is a chart demonstrating how our common ancestor, the common ancestor of human and non-human primates, gave rise to the monkeys, gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. 
We all started out having the same genetic makeup. But over time, we diverged and now have difference, differences in our genetic makeup. But these differences are not great. They're actually very small differences. The second area of science that invalidates the notion of predictive ability of animal models is known as complexity science. Now, I apologize for this slide. It's a very busy slide, and I certainly don't expect you to understand all of it. But I have uh, drawn three circles on the slide that I would like to briefly discuss. A complex system is composed of simple systems that exist at lower levels of organization. In other words, we're all composed of stardust. We're composed of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and a carbon atom in me acts exactly the same way that it acts in a chicken or a mouse or a chimpanzee. But complex systems also have a hierarchy of organization. And what this means is that when all these atoms combine, form genes, and when all these genes combine and act in networks, you're now looking at a very different situation. At higher levels of organization, complex systems do not act the same way. And because they can act so differently, this can give rise to conditions characterized by chaos theory. And I will demonstrate chaos theory with this slide. This is a mathematical model that, where one complex system differed from a second complex system only at the fourth place past the decimal. That is a very, very small difference between two mathematical systems. And yet, as you can see, as this computer program was run, the differences between the light dark line and the dark line became more and more manifest. What this means is that the, if a drug were given to a human being represented by the dark line, the drug would kill the human being. Whereas if the drug were given to a human being represented by the lighter colored line, that drug would be curative. And in fact, this is exactly what we find in human medicine. As we all know, not all humans react the same way to drugs and disease. Finally, to support the theoretical concerns coming from evolutionary biology and complexity science, there is ample empirical evidence to invalidate animal models as having predictive value for humans. This is one slide. There are numerous slides like this in the scientific literature on a variety of subjects. But on this particular slide, you're measuring human bioavailability versus the bioavailability of the same drugs in three animals, primates, rodents, and dogs. Now, if this graph looks confusing, that's because it is. That's the point. There is no semblance of organization to this graph. In science, we call this a shotgun pattern or a scattergram. And what this means is, if a drug is given to a human being and you want to know how much of that drug is available in the tissue and to affect the organ that needs to be affected, studying an animal will give you absolutely no idea whatsoever. If, the, if animals did have predictive value, you would expect all of these dots to be clustered and look like approximately a 45 degree angle going from the bottom left to the top right. As you can see, that is not the case. Now, what this means is that even though animals will occasionally have the same bioavailability as humans, the animal does this so infrequently that even when we know the bioavailability data from animals, we still have no idea what the bioavailable, bioavailability will be in humans. And again, this can be reproduced for toxicity, it can be reproduced for carcinogens, it can be reproduced for cancer, drugs, and so on and so on. And yet, this is exactly why animals are used. So we can test or do research on an animal and know what will happen in a human being. Animals fail in this purpose in every situation. But again, that is why we are supposedly using them in the first place. I am not saying that animals and humans have nothing in common. We obviously do. 
All animals, all mammals at least, have hearts and lungs, and these organs do roughly the same thing in every mammalian species. But disease and drug response occur at higher levels of organization, and it is here that very small genetic differences outweigh the gross similarities between species. Not only do genetic differences outweigh the gross similarities among species, but very small differences in genetics also outweigh the myriad similarities among human beings. Today we are in the era known as personalized medicine. This means that we want to match a drug to your genetic profile, not your mother's, not your sister's, and certainly not mine. There is no more one-size-fits-all in medicine. For years we have known that men and women react differently to drugs, and disease. We have known that ethnic groups vary in their reactions to drugs and disease. But recently we have also learned that identical twins sometimes differ in their response to drugs and disease. If anyone tells you that an animal model has been modified genetically to mimic a human being, please ask them how genetically modified it will have to be in order to be as identical to a human as two identical twins. If two identical twins do not always react the same way to drugs and disease, then it is impossible that animal models, genetically modified or not, are going to have any predictive value for humans. Furthermore, we have known for years that a majority of drugs are either ineffective or not tolerated by most humans. This leads me to, I believe I have 16 minutes, is that correct? How many? Oh, I, I was told I had 16. I, 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 no, I, I apologize. I, uh, I have a 16 minute talk, but uh, so I, I, I will try and speed it up. We'll just skip this slide. Ah, that's good, we'll skip that. The, the initiative that we're talking about today concerns both science and ethics, but if animals have no predictive value for human response to drugs and disease, then there is no way that vivisection can be a necessary evil. I apologize for going over time. Uh, there was some communication problems, but again, thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. It would be unreasonable of me to expect all of you to understand fully all the scientific topics that I have so briefly covered here today. I have written over 20 articles in peer-reviewed journals, and very few scientists even understand all of the science uh, regarding my position. But the bottom line is society as a whole is being harmed both directly and indirectly because of animal modeling. If the EC is serious about saving the lives of people suffering from illnesses, such as neurological illnesses, and wish to do so in the most efficient and effective manner possible, then the EC needs to pursue evaluating this initiative in a suitable forum. Both defenders of animal modeling and I should be allowed time to present our cases and given enough time to thoroughly explain and answer all of the issues that have been raised here today. I have been willing to do this for quite some time, but the animal model community has never agreed to these conditions. That alone should tell you volumes about their position. I want the opportunity to defend what current science reveals and have offered to do this more times than I can count. I want experts in the relevant areas of science to judge my position. And then let's have a discussion about all of this and all the questions that have been raised. Finally, let me just point out that what you have heard today from almost every person that has spoken are mere claims. You've heard claims that animal models have been successful at doing this and that in the past. Well, I can claim that I've walked on the moon, but you know what? I never have. And as a scientist and physician, and as a somewhat of a historian, I can tell you that every single time that I have done research into where the great discoveries and great breakthroughs of the past came from, animal models played a minimal role, if they played any role at all. 
and a vast majority of the time, not only did they play a minimal role, but that role was misleading. <laughs> HIV is considered the modern day polio, and the polio vaccine would have been available 40 years before had not monkey research misled the researchers on the origin of the disease. That is just one example. I've written five books that have hundreds more. Do not take somebody's word for it. Do not take my word for it. Let's have a two or three week open debate on this so that you, members of the European Parliament and the European Commission, can make an informed decision. Thank you. As a veterinary surgeon, as, as a veterinary surgeon, um, I say to people that I would not test a drug intended for horses on parrots. And people laugh because they get the message straight away. So if we shouldn't test drugs for horses on parrots, why do we test drugs for people on rats and mice? It's, it's as illogical as it is unscientific. I'm a member of two animal research ethics committees. And it is very frustrating for people like myself not to be able to challenge the validity of the animal model. I am told that I have to stick to the three R's, which is what the directive sets down. I am not allowed to go beyond the, the boundaries set down by the three R's. So I cannot challenge the validity of the animal model. A lot of research today involves mice and it involves cancer research. And the animal researcher will say, I cannot do this in human cell culture. And that animal researcher is right. You cannot study mouse immune system in human cells. But should we be spending money and time and effort doing mouse research when we could be improving the technology using human data? So I feel that the directive, first of all, has failed to question the scientific validity of animal experiments in relation to human health care because almost all animal research proposals are justified by saying this is what I'm going to do to a mouse and, and this is going to perhaps find a cure for and then the, the, the space is left blank you can fill in what you want it can be Alzheimer's, it can be Parkinson's, it can be cancer it can be multiple sclerosis uh, all of the scientific literature shows that the chances of basic research, because this is what this is, basic research, curiosity-driven research, with no applicability, although the animal researcher will say, yes, this has applicability to human disease, all of the scientific literature shows that the chances of basic research leading to a clinical result is in the order of 0.004%. 0.004%. So we should be asking ourselves, is this the most efficient way of using our resources? Is this the way to progress? Uh, I think it's not. So I think, again, the, the directive has betrayed public trust in terms of the composition of ethics committees, which are weighted heavily in favor of animal researchers and do not necessarily have experts on alternatives, and even if they did have experts on alternatives, there is no legal definition of an alternative. And, an, and, and if you try to take an animal researcher to court, if you try to challenge an animal researcher by saying that instead of this, the animal researcher should be doing something related to humans, you have to find expert witnesses, you have to fund lawyers. The situation is such that our hands are tied. The animal researchers have got their cake and they are eating it. Thank you. The biggest challenge, the biggest challenge to the European Citizens Initiative is not the science, ladies and gentlemen, it's communication. The idea behind the ECI was to raise the level of the debate from simply animal welfare to the validity of the animal model. And what we've done today is touch very, very superficially on the science and what we would like to ask the European Commission is to organize a scientific public debate 
similar to a public jury, not where the experts have 10 minutes, but where we have three or four or five days to discuss the science with experts from both sides. If we do not do this, if we do not have a serious scientific debate, we are letting down the 1.17 million people who signed the ECI, we are letting down the animals, and we are letting down patients who want cures based on personalized medicine, not animal tests. So I believe that we have the technology. The technology, if you want an example of Botox, which you all know, and I'm sure not many of you use, but Botox is botulinum toxin, the most, toxin, the most toxic substance known to science. And for years and years, the scientific community and the industry said, there is no way that we can replace the use of mice to test the potency of Botox. Well, it's only because Botox has a cosmetic application that it was brought into the public view. And it was thanks to public opinion that persuaded the manufacturer of Botox in the United States called Allegan that their profits might dip. And the moment that happens, industry amazingly overnight finds a completely cell-based, non-animal test method for the most toxic substance known to science. So ladies and gentlemen, the obstacle here is not the science. It's communicating a very complex message, which we obviously couldn't do today with, with experts speaking for 10 minutes or, or less. We need a serious scientific debate because I think we will win the scientific debate. And once the public realizes that animal testing is not a necessary evil, which is what we've been sold for years and years and years, we can take away the necessary because we have the technology. All that's left is the evil. Public opinion will not tolerate evil and will sweep away the evil. Thank you.